the services. Welcome everybody in person and everybody online. Good to see you guys all for another week. It is month five, day nine, and we are 51 days away from trumpets. And so everybody please rise. We'll have the opening prayer by Brother Dylan Swan. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we have so many things to be grateful for. We'd like to thank you for um, thank you for this church and thank you for our congregations and thank you for the thank you for the leadership in this church and uh, and allowing them to to bring your word to us and, and Father, we just mostly thank you for your love and your word and uh, thank you for letting us or guiding us through the world this week and uh, and, ac and having access to your word that helps us get through this strange world. And thank you for inviting us into your Sabbath day. And uh, we ask that you continue to, uh, to bless us with your Holy Spirit. And we ask that you bless the, the speaker with uh, your Holy Spirit and your word and, and help us open our hearts to take in your word. And uh, Father, we just uh, ask that you know that we love you and we come to you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Remain standing. We'll turn to our first hymn. It'll be on page 99. I sing the mighty power of God. Page 99. Pages back to page 70. We'll sing Hallelujah, Praise God. Page 70. Eternal shall reign, shall reign 
standing and open up your Bibles. We'll do the scripture reading. It'll be from Philippians 3, verses 12 to 16, and read by Brother Andrew Cox. Pressing on toward the goal. Not that I have already obtained all this, or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to do, have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should take such a view of things, and if on some point you think differently, That, too, God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Amen. Thank you, Brother Andrew. May all be seated. We'll have the intercessory prayer portion. A few prayer requests uh, from the Ottawa congregation. Margaret Townsend is uh, experiencing issues with her throat and mouth. She would also... uh, that she would like prayers for. Also, she would like prayers for uh, her wisdom as she proceeds with treatment. Uh, uh, John Romanus from BC, uh, pray for him as he continues to have uh, health struggles. And Jean-Michel Belanger uh, continues with health struggles. And the brethren in Ottawa are asking prayers for his body, mind, and spirit. So we'll have a couple minutes alone and then we'll come together. I ask you to please rise and as we go to God together. 
Dear God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for everything you give us in our in our lives daily. Um, and as mentioned in the opening prayer, that you bring us through this evil world every week and to your Sabbath day. Um, we ask you at this time for your your mercy on these people mentioned. And we know there are so many more around the world and of your believers that are struggling. You know you're all knowing and know every one of them. And we ask you to be with all of them, if it be your will, to heal them and put your, your guiding hands and your healing hands around them. We thank you so much for everything you give us every day. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Remain standing and grab your hymnals. We'll go to the last hymn before the main message. It'll be on page 50, 50 for the beauty of the earth, after which we'll have the main message of the day entitled Pressing Towards the Mark by Pastor Murray Palmer. Page 50. Now for the main message of Pastor Good afternoon, everyone, here in Hamilton, Stony Creek, also known as Burlington, and to our guests who are joining us online. Certainly great to be back together with you after a couple of weeks away. Certainly enjoyed our trip into Western Canada, my wife and I did, but it's an absolute blessing to be back here together on this most holy Sabbath day. It's my other brothers who normally are here are time, spending time with their family. Pastor Adrian is visiting another congregation, Deacon Jan and his family I greet you where you are at your cottage, a well-deserved break that you're having. Before we get started, a brother shared a really, it's not often you get a funny joke, a clean funny joke these days. And it it's, has a biblical connotation to it, to it as well. So we all know, Romans 6.23, the wages of sin are death. Once taxes are taken off, don't worry, it's really just more of a tired feeling. 
I'm not the greatest at telling jokes, but the joke was much better than its delivery. Jim White, Jim White grew up in West Texas before moving to the California coast to study at Pepperdine, a Christian university in Malibu. Yeah, back then when he went, everyone wanted to head to the West Coast for the sun and beauty of California. And there were even Christian universities there too. These days, people move out of California for the most part, but back then people actually moved to California for the beauty and son of, of that. Upon graduation, he became a teacher and found his way a couple of hours north to the small farming town of McFarland in California, near Bakersfield. As he built his career in this small town, teaching various subjects, his love of coaching directed his path from high school football eventually to cross country running. And while high school football, especially in small towns in the United States, was a headlining sport, Jim developed a love for the grueling sport of running. Over the course of his 23 year coaching career, he made a difference in the lives of so many people in this little farming community. The town of McFarland, at least back then, was a farming community settled mostly by Latino, I think that's still an okay word to use, Latino immigrants from Mexico and Central America. Uh, parents who brought their families to America for a better life. Jim witnessed many of these high school students, these children of, these, of this, these far, this farming community, working long, back-breaking hours in the fields before and after school, getting up, at the, getting up before sunrise, being in the fields uh, as, as the sun rose, working until the start of school, running, uh, running to, to school to be part of school, then going back and finishing the day out there so they could support their families in their quest to have a better life. This stamina, he thought, was perfect for cross-country running. Cross-country running, if you're not familiar with it, isn't just running. It's neither a sprint nor a marathon. Typically, it's 10 kilometers in length, six to seven miles for our, our friends south of the border, though even that can vary. And cross-country courses take runners off-road through woodlands, through open country, often including hills and other obstacles. Uh, up here, I don't know if you have it down south, but up here we, we call them tough mudders now. Uh, I've never done that, but I've always wanted to do a tough mudder. That's usually where a little bit more rain is involved and you get all grimy and, and muddy. But over the course of his 23 years coaching this sport, Jim's teams, even in this small town of McFarland, won several state championships. Not bad for a small farming town. But Jim's impact on the town was felt long after his students graduated. Many went on to f very fulfilling careers, careers that wouldn't have been possible without his coaching. Many of these students were destined to continue to work the farm fields that their parents were, had worked. And that was, that was it oftentimes was the only dream of the family. At least they had those jobs. They would work hard and build their families through working the, the hard labor on the farm, scrambling day by day to get by. But cross country provided many with opportunities through scholarship. Some even came back after, after uh, going to uh, further their education through scholarship and came back to the town of McFarland and became leaders in their community, police officers, firemen, uh, teachers in their community, giving back to others who had given them the opportunity uh, that Jim had given them. His story is told, if you're not familiar with it, with some liberties that Hollywood typically takes in the movie McFarland, USA, starring Kevin Costner plays the role of, of, of Jim White. A rather actually decent movie, given what movies are available these days. But the apostolic writings are replete with scriptures that compare our walk with that of a runner. As Paul neared the end of his life, let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3 as we begin. He compared his life at the end with a marathon race, and similar to that which would have been present at, the, at that time with the Olympic, the, the ancient Olympics. Second Timothy chapter three. Second Timothy chapter three.
Second Timothy chapter four. Sorry about that. My bad. Second Timothy chapter four, where Paul says, "For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness." which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but to all those who have loved his appearing. Long before he reached the end of his race, which, as we know chronologically, 2 Timothy was the the last letter that we have recorded for us in the canon that he would have uh, written to his uh, protege, Timothy, before he died, probably weeks, maybe months, maybe days, we're not sure, before he would have been uh, uh, assassinated or, or killed by by uh, Festus and, and the, 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 the leaders that, that uh, killed him. But long before he came to this conclusion at the end of his life, he still had this mindset of this race running. And we see that back in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 3. Man, oh man, my typing is off here today. Fat fingers in my notes. Philippians chapter 3, where Brother Andrew just read. Philippians chapter 3. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I press toward the mark for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let's take a moment to analyze this this phrase here, pressing toward the mark. The word press in in, uh, the Greek lexicon is the word dioko. Dioko, and it's uh, 1377 if you take notes, if you're interested in checking up on me. And these days you just have your biblical your uh, concordance on your phone. You can tap it, check in, check up on me. It's the biblical. It's the Greek word dioko, and it means we've. It's translated press. It means to aggressively chase, like a hunter pursuing a catch, or like a hunter pursuing a prize, or to zealously hunt down. This sort of adds a little bit to this this phrase here. To aggressively chase after after like a hunter. I'm not a hunter. I have friends that are hunters. You can, no, nothing will hold a hunter back when it's hunting season. Aggressively chasing or pursuing that prize catch. The word toward is the Greek word kata, kata, 2596. And it's obviously, but it bears, bears mentioning, directional in nature. And it has a, but it's specifically referring to a terminus or an end point. So it's not just head that way, but it's specifically, there, there's an end point that this word is being used for. That is, that is, that is and the reason why this particular word is used for toward is because there, there's, a, there's a specific point that they're, they're looking towards. And then interesting here, the word mark, if you're, if you're, you're reading another a version, it could, it could say goal, pressing toward the goal or pressing toward the mark, is the Greek word skopos, skopos, 4649 in the, in the Greek lexicon. And it is from the, word, the Greek word from which we get the English word scope, skopos. And it is the end marker of a foot race. That was, that was how it was used back then. We know that the, the, we, if you're familiar with the ancient Olympics where it got started back then, the, the uh, marathon, in fact, took place because of a, a uh, battle. If you've watched the movie, uh, I think it's uh, three, is it the 300? Or, uh, um, anyway, there's a, there's a movie that uh, deals with uh, Leonidas. And, and um, that the battles that were taking place around the end of the, uh, the beginning of the 300s in BC, where they get the, the uh, uh, one fellow ran uh, so, so a, a long distance, and that became the, the basis for the concept of a marathon race. But this word skopos talks about a, a specific mark that we keep our eye on, and it's the actual end marker of a foot race. So we consider this, this phrase, that we've read hundreds of times, pressing toward the mark. We're really talking about aggressively pursuing a prize, a catch, and, and we have that defined for us. We'll go into that a little bit later. 
but aggressively pursuing a specific goal that's, that's way beyond. You're, you, there's a lot of stuff going on here, but there's a, a finish line that we're keeping our eyes on. And that's what we're, that's what we're aggressively pursuing, trying to chase down that point, the, the finish line. There's something interesting about the sport of cross-country running that's applicable to our journey. Runners are awarded based on their individual placement of finish, like you would expect in any, any race. You, if you're participating in cross-country, you must cross the finish line. But what's different from other track events, other racing events, and even in the Olympics, is that in cross-country, teams are awarded for their collective placement of finish. Teams are awarded. And this is just as, and often, more important than individual placements. Teams are sent, and your, collect, your collective finish is combined, and it is the team that is lauded for, their, for, for winning the day. Sure, there's, there's uh, honors that go to the winner, the second, the third place individual, but what stands out is which team won. And we see from Jim's example that his teams won several state champions. Just this little farming community somewhere in the middle of California took on all these other cities in the States and many, many times, seven or eight times, won the state championship. So, so while you may cross the finish line, need to cross the finish line, we must also cross the finish line. That's what cross country teaches. That's what cross country teaches. Unlike the smooth surface of a road race or the soft rubber of a track, the, the terrain is very difficult with hills and valleys, with rocks, trees, and other obstacles that can't be seen until there they are, they pop up. The start and finish points are well marked, well known. We know it's here, we know I gotta get to there. But in between, who knows what will pop up and what, what will come up against us. That we'll find out while we run. Training matters in cross country. You don't just show up and hope to do well in a cross country race. It takes time to build the stamina, to build the strength, to take on the grueling terrain of a cross-country route. And another point that cross-country teaches is that coaching matters. Coaching matters. Jim White proved it time and time again with his multiple championships, taking this little town of farm workers and turning them into state championship cross-country winning teams, molding individuals who had never done this before, when only one person crosses the finish line first, but more often than not, his teams were always the best in the state. It wasn't the coaching on race day that mattered. It was all of the hours and days spent in preparation, all the little items that went into their preparation, how to overcome fatigue, how to understand stamina, when to stay with the pack, when to make a break for it, how to avoid the obstacles. All of this coming together on race day when it mattered most, so that the team finishes the race, and the team wins. Today, I want to talk together about pressing toward the mark. But let's lay the groundwork first here. I've heard, and I'm sure you have, innumerable sermons about running the race over the years, all poignant and meaningful at the time. I've, I've learned a lot from them. My intent today isn't to fill an hour with a feel-good message just because my name popped up on the speaking schedule. That's not why we're going to talk about running the race today. We live, the, 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 what I'd like to lay the groundwork for is we live in an evil world. We live in an evil, evil world. Let's not sugarcoat it for being the purposes of being a nice Christian. We live in an evil world. That's at the heart of something we need to understand. Let me also remind us that there are those out there doing the work of the adversary. They are, his, they are his minions. They are doing the work of the adversary. Whether they don't know it or not, whether they even understand it or not, they're doing the work of the adversary and are participating in his war against the saints. And if we think, if we think we're in just in a nice, as we consider Paul's writing and the, the other apostles as they write about what it means to be in this, this run, this journey, this lifelong uh, race that we're in. If we think we're running a 5,000 meter run on a nice rubber track in a multi-million dollar stadium with the best track shoes money can buy, that's not the case. That's not the case. We're in an evil world. 
we're in an evil world. So let me be more specific. What I'd like to talk today about is pressing toward the mark today. What does it mean to press toward the mark in the society that we live in, with all that's going on around us? How do we zealously hunt down eternal life in the midst of a grueling, painful race with constantly changing terrain, and do so that you and we might win the prize? Let's stay in Philippians. Stay here where we are, Philippians chapter 3, and talk about the present tense. Let's talk about where we are today. We'll go back to what we read. We were already aware, but let's look at it again. And as we consider the present tense, because we recall this was Paul long before he had come to the end of his life, when he had realized the race, his race was, over, was nearing its end, and there was a crown laid up for him. Here's where his mindset was in the middle of the race, like most of us, all of us are. In the, the middle, some maybe near the beginning middle, some nearing the, maybe the closer to the end middle, but we're all in the middle of, the, of our race. And let's notice what Paul's coaching brings out for us in this, in this passage here in Philippians chapter 3. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Paul, in the middle of his race, says, I haven't attained the prize yet. I can see it. It's over there. I'm keeping my eyes on it, but I haven't got the prize yet. And I'm not perfect. And when we, whenever you read the word perfect in Scripture, it means complete. It's the Greek word teleos that means complete. It's the, it's, it's the end of the process, the end of the sanctification process where, where we are made like Christ. You can read a lot about that in chapter 2 of Philippians, beginning back around verse 5. Paul covers that extensively there. But I press on, he says, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. He keeps running zealously. It's that same word, press on, here that we read later on in the, in the passage down in verse 14. That word, dioko. I keep running zealously. I keep, I'm on that hunt because my eyes are, are on that goal, and I keep running with the aim of, of making sure I make it to that finish line. I run zealously so that I may lay hold of the prize that Christ holds out for me. So while there, there's that finish line there, Christ is, in effect, holding out this crown for us, that as long as we keep running, as long as we keep, keep running, we will be able to hit that finish line and be given that crown that Paul talks about that we read about in 2 Timothy. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Paul says, the one thing that I do is I stop looking back. I can't look back because I'm going to trip. There are obstacles in front of me. I need to look forward. There's a lot of stuff that goes on in our, in our past. Paul says, I'm putting that behind me. I'm not looking back. If I've, if I've got the goal ahead and we, know, and we realize that it's not a nice round rubber track of, of 400 meters that I, I can program my brain, but if I look back to glance at maybe something that's bothering me, something that's hindering me, the, the, the sins that so easily ensnare us that we look back, maybe our past, Paul says, I don't look back. I'm looking forward. I'm looking forward. We don't look back. The last few years, as we pause here, have been very eye-opening for us. If you go back to the feast in 2019, it was probably the last nice little time that we had free of... We didn't know when we left the feast in 2019 what was just around the corner. The obstacles for the disciples have been numerous. I won't even take the time to list them. In fact, I believe uh, Pastor Adrian ran down a long list of them last week in his message. I, I believe it was last week. So I won't take the time to repeat those, but we can all think of all of the obstacles we've been through. But that's back there. That's back there. We must keep looking for, and that's what Paul is encouraging as a, as a coach in this race. Paul is encouraging us what he says, the one thing that I do, 
I don't count myself to have apprehended yet. The prize is still out there. I can see Christ holding it out and I haven't gone there yet. But the one thing that I do, I forget the things that are in behind me and I run forward. You know what would be so cool? This is what would be so cool. Lisa and I are pretty much close to our empty nest years. We are right, if, they're, if we're not in them, I think we're kind of in them. We had a great two weeks out west. We're in our empty nest years. I remember what it was like when my parents reached their empty nest years. The late 80s, the mid 90s, think back, they were great times. To be right there at retirement, have the world by the tail. My parents, when they entered their, their empty nest years, and I meant some of you here could probably uh, experience the same. Everything was affordable. Life was great. Church was great. There were huge feast sites, lots of stuff to do together. Everybody pretty much got along in church and outside of church. This was like the perfect time to be an empty nester, to have paid all your bills, to have a little bit of green in your jeans, and be able to enjoy life a little bit. The world was our oyster. The world was their oyster or their ahi tuna, if clean and unclean makes a difference. Let's just, but what we see today is let's just cross our fingers and hope that we go back to this because it's been a bad couple of years and I just want to go back to the way it was. That would be so nice, especially for my kids that are trying to build their lives together. But Paul says, stop looking back and look forward. The goal is out there. So that's how we, that's what the coach is telling us here is how to get through this life is to move forward. Forget what's back here. Ignore, ignore all of the good times. They, they imprint you who you are, but don't try to recreate those. We press forward to where we need to be because the race is still ongoing and there are obstacles that are popping up. Stop looking back and look forward. Reach forward to those things which are ahead, Paul says. The end goal is ahead that we must press forward to. But guess what? There are obstacles out there that are going to get in our way. That's what we're being told here. That's what we're being told. We need to reach out. And what we see here, let's continue. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. So while the goal, the finish line is out there, and I'm keeping my eye on it. You know what else is out there on the way to the finish line? Obstacles. We have to reach out for those too, because they're there. If we want to get to the end point, we have to reach out for the obstacles. We can't be afraid of the obstacles. We can't be afraid of the things that will pop up and try to get us off course. We actually have to reach out for them. Let's attack them. And we're going to, we're going to see here how pressing toward the mark and understanding that it's not just the goal we need to get through, but we need to navigate these obstacles so that we get to the goal and how to do that. And that's what Paul is telling us here. I've reached forward to those things, plural. So it's not just the end goal, it's everything else in between that he reaches out for. I pressed, and by, do, by reaching out for those, he's understanding that he's pressing toward the goal, the mark of the high calling, of the prize of God in Christ Jesus. Continuing on, verse 15. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this in mind. And if, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Let us. Recall what we studied before, that Philippians was written to a group. The group is a unit. If you go back to, hold your place here, go back to chapter 1. And there's, I think Philippians is, not I think, the, Philipp, the book of Philippians is in the archives of the line-by-line -line study. We've covered it in sermons here. But the, this, this letter to the church in, in Philippi was to the group as a unit. To all the saints, verse, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and the deacons. So this wasn't just an individual letter sent to individuals to read. But we see here, to all the saints with the bishops and the deacons. So as a unit, the, the leadership, the members, the, 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 the uh, episcopos, the, the diaconate, and, the, and the, the, the saints, all together. Grace to you, and the word you is, is this singular, singular pluralized word that kind of encapsulates them all. And peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And then flipping forward, and we recall many years ago that we, uh, there was a sermon or two on this in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, so again, we see here that, that, that a singular group word, my beloved, referring to them as a, as a group, this congregation, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And how that word work out can be applied to the individual, but it also applies to the group. Also applies to the group. So when we go back to Philippians 3, and we read in verse 15, therefore let us, this is that group mentality that, that, that the coach here is trying to help us understand. These, are, these admonitions are being written to the group as a unit because being in a team matters. That's what we learn from cross country as well. Being in a team matters. Why? Well, we see here, as many as are mature, we're all at different levels of maturity of the faith of Christ. Nobody is less important than the other, but we're all at different places in the race. You send a team out there, there's going to be those that are in the lead. There are others in the back. But how the team finishes matters in this case. And we, and we can lean on each other as we go through these obstacles. There's going to be obstacles you're going to be aware of because you've been through it that I never would have seen come up. And that teams help each other get through this. While you're running your race, the team needs us all to win. That's what cross country teaches us. That's what we get here from the Apostle Paul. Your experience might help me. Pause here. We're going to come back to it. Pause here. Let's go to Galatians chapter 6, just a few pages back. Galatians chapter 6. And we see the impact that as a, as a, as a unit, as a group, we can have on each other. Galatians chapter 6. And these aren't scriptures you haven't heard. I've covered them time and again, especially over the last few years. Brethren, verse 1 of Galatians 6. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted, and to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. This is part of what we do. We help each other through. When there are obstacles, and when there are obstacles, sometimes we Sometimes we get tripped up by an obstacle. Sometimes we'll be dealing with an obstacle over here and not realize there's an obstacle down here that gets us tripped up. It, it's, it, it, could be our, it could be our own uh, sinful actions. It could just be the way Satan's, uh, the adversary is trying to get us in uh, too many different ways. We don't have enough eyes. And, and sometimes we'll just get tripped up as human beings. There could be any number of things here. But brethren, it, it says here, to the, to the group, restore each other in a spirit of of gentleness and bear one another's burdens. That takes a team. And we've covered that. And that, that's why we cover that time and time again. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Again, considering this zealous pursuit of the mark in today's day and age. Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 24. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting, and so much more, so much more, so much the more, as you see the day approaching. This matters. And even for those of you who are isolated and join us online, I see through the comments and the relationships that you've developed just simply by being connected through a service, something like, like this, or through the weekly Bible studies, or maybe it's not even us, it's, it could be the Medina service, or wherever it is that, that we find connections. I see connections from people in the southern U.S., into Africa, into eastern Canada, western Canada, all people who are doing the best that they can, being isolated as they are, but trying to become part of what, what we've, we've termed a virtual congregation. So we've got our congregation here, but those that are regular that join the same service can be part of a virtual congregation. And that, that helps. I, I see the help that, that goes on uh, through, those, through those relationships. But we see it here. This is so much more as you see the day approaching. It becomes increasingly important to ensure that you're connected somehow, somehow. 
Let's go back to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians 3. We'll just finish off this passage here. Read verse 15 and 16 again in a different, uh, in a different uh, translation. If you are differently minded about anything, because that happens when you bring a family together, it can be a physical family, it can be a spiritual family. We don't always see eye to eye on things. That's just, that's just natural. If you are differently minded about anything, God will reveal it to you. The important part is, is, is understanding that there's an us. Only let, verse 16, only let our conduct fit the level we have already reached. That speaks to the going back, not going back. So when we hit, when we reach certain levels of, of stamina, certain in our race, in, our, in, in that, this cross-country run, this race that we're on, when we reach certain levels, we need to maintain those levels and not fall back. Only let our conduct fit the level we have already reached. This is the importance here that we're getting from Paul here as he coaches us in this, this concept of, of this race that we're looking at, this pressing toward the goal, this zealous, this zealous attack of the, of the finishing point. Let's go to Matthew 25. Take another look at the parable of the ten virgins from this perspective of pressing toward the mark, of zealously pushing toward this goal in this in this sick, sick, changing world that we're a part of today. And the kingdom of heaven shall be likened, verse 1, to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. But what happened before they went out to meet the bridegroom? That's where the story starts to fill in here. Five of them are wise. Five of them are wise or we might deem it, the, the, the Greek word there is sensible. Some, five of them were sensible. Five of them were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps. So the bridegroom comes. Everybody jumps to attention because the bridegroom is, is entering, coming to pick up the bride. So the attendants awake from slumber, and five of them had no oil took no oil with them. So there's no time at this point to get ready. The bridegroom is, is coming down the path to pick, up the, to pick up the bride. The attendants are there because they have to line his path with the lights. And five of them, half of them say, uh, we, we've got no oil. Can you, can, you, can you share some oil with us? The wise, uh, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. So while they were ready, and they fell asleep, and then he comes a little bit later than they anticipated, but their, their duties are, they, they stand and get ready and line, line the street, line the, the pathway with their lights. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, or got them, tried to, tried to light them. They, they all lit their lamps. And the, the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered and said, No lest there not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. Yeah, but there's not enough time. And while they went to buy, while they were gone, okay, we'll go try and buy some. The bridegroom came. There wasn't enough time. And those who were ready went in with him into the wedding, and the door was shut. Note that slumbering and sleeping weren't the problem. We, we, tend, to, we tend to blame them for slumbering and sleeping. We're human. That happens. You know, it's, it's not good to fall asleep but waiting for the bridegroom. But it wasn't the actual slumbering and sleeping that was the problem because the five that had oil, they were allowed in. So it wasn't the sleeping that was the problem. It was when they slept. It was when they slept. Did they sleep before or after they prepared? That's the problem. Did they fall asleep? Did they get prepared and then slumber off? Which I'm not saying is a good thing but they were ready. They got all of their work done first and allowed themselves to have a bit of a cat nap. While the others, like the hare and the tortoise in that fable by Aesop, the others decided they're going to sleep first. They're going to look after themselves first. 
And when the bridegroom came, that was the problem. Who was ready and who's not? The foolish were focused on how they felt today. I'm just so tired. Let me sleep first. I'll look after my physical needs today, and I'll have enough time to do what I need to do when I see him coming. When I'll have enough time. What we see here in verse 8 through 10 that we read already, as much as this is a team race, my effort counts. I act, as much as we want to get in together, my effort counts. I can't ride your coattails in. I may get some help from you, but I can't ride your coattails in because my effort also counts. As much as the team effort, the team results count, my effort counts. That's, what we, that's part and parcel of what we see here. So we've talked present day. Let's look forward into the future as we consider what it's going to be like as what we read in Hebrews 10, as the day approaches. What will it be like as the day approaches? We know, but it's good to be reminded. Let's go to Revelation 1. We've read this countless of times before. Revelation 1. Verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God, which the Father, gave to Christ so that he could show his servants, the saints, things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Christ, to all things that he saw. And blessed is he... Of the, of the group of saints who received this, who reads and those who hear and keep reading and keep hearing the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are in it, for the, the time is near. But the Father, as we read in verse 1, gave Christ things to show his saints that must take place before his return. We've read this countless of times before. We've gone through the book of Revelation. We will continue to go through the book of Revelation from time to time. All of these things that must take place before the return of Christ. I know we talk about it a lot, but isn't it nice to know where the obstacles lie? We, we see here, we talk about, we see here these things that must shortly take place. Let's go back in our minds to what we just read about moving forward and pressing forward to the, to the things that lie ahead which include the obstacles. If there are obstacles, isn't it nice to know where they are, that they exist, and maybe where they are? Last week, let's talk about studying obstacles. Last week, Pastor Adrian talked about his golf game and that miraculous 30-foot putt, which I was very impressed with. I golf every now and then, but not regular enough to be any good at it. And when I say any good at it, I'm no good at it. Students of the game practice golf. They study the undulation of the greens, how the greens are, are set up, because they, they're, they're set up this way, they, they roll this way, there's all sorts of, and if you, and if you, get, a, a prop, if you get a proper green guide, it'll tell you exactly which way, every part of the green, every inch of the green, there's an arrow on it that tells you exactly how it's, how it's done. You get a guide for the, the whole hole, where the sand traps are, where the trees are. They study these undulations. So that wherever their ball lands, they know what it's going to take to knock in this putt. They can play the right shot even to sink longer putts than even 30 feet. They know where the sand traps are. They know where the rough is. What kind of club needs to select? What kind of, how hard to swing? What angle of play? I know all these things. I just practice enough or at all to get any good at it. It takes years of study and years of practice. To, be, to become that good, to know all of these things. When I think of golf, and once in a while, Landon and I will go out and have a little fun, I imagine standing over a putt, analyzing the green, making just the right contact, and dropping it in. But you know what? It's never going to happen because I don't practice. I don't practice. So as much as I can sit there and dream about what it would be like to, to 
match that putt we heard about last week. I would love, my dream of my life would be to drain a putt like that. It's never going to happen for me because I don't practice. I don't study. So why would I, I'm, I'm wasting my time dreaming of doing that if I'm not going to put the work in. Did you know that golf even has team events? Golf has team events. You know, it's, they're not advertised much, but golf has team events. There's best balls, there's uh, scrambles, all these sorts of things. Golf has team events. Do you know who loves team golf? Me. I love team golf. It's a ton of fun. Because you select the drive of the person who hit the ball best. And everyone hits it from there. So it doesn't matter how bad I am. I know I'm shooting from wherever the best guy is, and I know it's not going to be me. I get to have fun and ride the coattails of people who've put in the time and put in the practice. You know who hates having, you know who hates having me on their team? Everybody. Everybody. Because I'm just a waste of space. Golf is a game where you also study the terrain. Are there sand traps? Are there trees in the way? If my ball hits, what direction is it going to bounce? All this takes time and practice. That's why we put in the work. That's why we get, that's why we get the coaching, to put in the work so that you know where the obstacles are, so that you know what it's going to take. Ball can, if, I, if I'm a student of golf, I may once in a while hit it wrong, but if it goes there, I know what it's going to take to get it back on course because I, I, I know exactly how things work. I see, I see the, the green through the, the Terminator, the, way back when the Terminator was, was a movie there. You could see everything through his, through, his, through his lenses. Anyways, Revelation 12. Let's go to Revelation 12. We're talking about the future here. Revelation 12. So this letter, this Revelation from Jesus Christ to his saints before his return, so that we are aware of what things happen, what things are going to are things are going to take place. Let's read some of those things. Verse 13 of chapter 12. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. But the woman who was, was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. So we've got, we've got the, the dragon, the adversary. We know that and we know who the adversary is. Just a few verses earlier in verse nine, we have the adversary defined this dragon defined as, the, as, as our adversary, the devil, whose name is Satan. He's defined for us there. And he's persecuting the woman that gave birth to the male child. So we're here, and we're going to get that defined for us as we continue reading. Verse 17, and the dragon was enraged with this woman. Enraged. It was, it was his zealous focus was this woman. And he went to make war with the rest of her offspring. He couldn't overcome the male child, but he's going to make it his point to make war with the rest of her offspring. I failed there. He got me. I'm going to make war with the rest of them. Who keep, and who are these offspring? Those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of this male child. This one who succeeded, who's, giving, who's given them his testimony, those, those, they're in, they're, in my, they're in my sights. They're in my sights. Then I stood, verse chapter 13, on the sand of the sea and saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and his great authority. We talk about Satan having minions. This is one of his minions. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled. The entire world was marveling and following this beast that was making war with the church. The entire world is marveling. 
they're not they're no longer following the church. They're following the adversary, his minions. And all the world marveled and followed. Followed. That's a, that's a worship word. And we see that in verse 4. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast and saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to overcome this great being, this dragon? The entire world. And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And given authority to continue 42 months. This is, this is coming in the future. This is why we're reading this. Then he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. And it was granted to him. By who? It was granted by God. God has supreme authority. God allows this to happen. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. This is what is in the future. And authority was given him over every tribe. The, the, the adversary gave authority to the beast, God allowing all of this to happen. All who dwell on the earth will worship him. All except those, everybody's going to worship this beast, except those whose names are written in the book of life. This book of life of the lamb slain found from the foundation of the world. And if ever anyone has an ear, if you can hear this message, please hear it, Christ is saying. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed by the sword. These are obstacles that are, as we keep our eye on this kingdom, these are some of the obstacles that are in the way. But here is the patience and faith of the saints. We all want Christ to come back as soon as he can. As soon as God will allow it. Feast of Trumpets, Landon mentioned, is 51 days away. When we once again will rehearse and anticipate his return. That's one of the events that is in our scopos that we keep our eye on through our scope as we run this race. But as you run towards that goal, there are obstacles that will keep popping up because there's an adversary who has empowered others to make war with God's elect. And their goal is to overcome them. That's their goal. They don't know it. They don't know why, but they've been empowered to do this by the adversary who's working through these minions. As much as this is not good news right now, aren't we glad we know it? Doesn't it make it a little bit easier to know that there are obstacles? Aren't you glad you know why leaders of our countries today act like they've lost their minds? I read an article, and we might bring it up next week in our, our Keeping Watch, but there's a, an article that I read about how Justin Trudeau's uh, um, uh, climate reduction aims through, through the reduction of, of, of carbon emissions. There's no way they're going to fail. There, there's no way they're going to succeed by 2030. And he, they can't figure out why a leader is progressing down a path that there's no possible mathematical way for him to succeed. We know through this is that's not the point. They're not trying to clean up the climate. They're trying to, they have a different end game. So while even the smartest amongst us in the world can see this is going to fail, they can't figure out why. Aren't you glad you know why? Because there's an adversary simply bent on making war with the saints. We know why our leaders act like they've lost their minds, act like they, through years of documented history, it's clear how to run a successful country, how to run successful economies, how to run successful businesses. And yet insane ideas are pushed anyways, as if they're going to succeed. Aren't you glad you know why they're not going to succeed? Aren't you know, are glad you know why these seemingly smart people act like they've never been involved in an economy before? Many commentators try to figure out why and can't. But we know why. Because the adversary is making war with the saints. Some Christians may say, you know, it can't always be, why is it always about us? It can't always be about us. 
Why do we always point to the, this, this coming adversary and how, how it's always Satan looking against the Christians? There's other religions out there. There's other people out there. Why is it always about us? It can't always be about us. Yes, it can. Yes, it can. If you believe in the Bible, if you believe in the word of God, the kingdom is the goal. That's what's going to happen. Whether people understand it yet or not, that's going to happen. It can very well be always about the disciples of Christ because that's who Satan's at war. That's who the adversary is at war against. So yeah, it, it can always be about the disciples. At some point, at some level in understanding, this is what is going on. When you know who the Father is, when you know who the Messiah is, that they have a plan, we know this, that there's an end goal, that there's an adversary whose sole purpose, he failed with Christ, he failed with the male child, but I'm going to make sure I get to everybody else. That's his goal. When it's his sole purpose to make sure that we miss, isn't that good to know? It's, I hate saying it, but isn't it good to know? Aren't you glad you know? It's not popular, but it's true. It's not good news, but it's coming. And it's not even acceptable to say to many. But the fact that it's not acceptable to say doesn't make it any less true. Even if we can't say it, even if we're not supposed to say it, it doesn't make it any less true. Not according to Scripture. Do you know why we know this? We know this because coaching matters. We know this because there were people who taught us, who were taught by others, because they didn't know it either. They were taught by others who had preceded them in this race. And you know what? They were taught by others before them. And we've got the holy record of all those who went before us, who wrote it all down. And it all goes back to them. And then even before that, back to the prophets. And back before that, to the Torah. Because coaching matters. Someone's always coaching the next generation. But we know this because someone taught the generation before us. And they weren't smart about this until they were coached by the previous generation. That's why we know this. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 10. So we consider this concept of coaching mat mattering. Coaching matters. 1 Corinthians 10. Verse 6. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 6. Now these things, and he's referring back to verse 1. Let's go back to verse 1. Why not? First, uh, chapter 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware. I learned this from Christ. Recall, he learned this from Christ. He had time in, in the desert, one-on-one -on -one with Christ. He's passing this along. I don't want you to be unaware, he says, that all of our fathers were under the cloud. All passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food, all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with, but with most, yeah, we, we went back to verse 1, we started back at verse 1. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, verse 5 now, but with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. So looking back at their example, which we have in the written record. These things became our examples to the intent, this is the purpose why there are examples, that we shouldn't lust after evil things as they also lusted. This is coaching. That they, they, this, These were written for admonition so that we wouldn't take the same path they took because they succumbed to some of the obstacles in their race. And you know what? The obstacles are still there. The obstacles don't go away, but if we can be told that they're there, we might have a chance at avoiding them. Do not become idolaters as, as, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 fell. And you can reference those back in the, the, the stories of Moses, the history of Moses in the Torah. Nor let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain, as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. 
Now, all of these things happen to them as examples. So if, if, if they're going to suffer, if they're going to succumb to some of these obstacles, at least let's write them down and tell the next generation so they can learn, so they can avoid some of these same traps. And they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the age have come. This is why we do what we can. This is why we say what needs to be said, where and when we can. If you follow this service, and I can only speak for us here, if you follow the weekly Bible studies, our new Keeping Watch podcast, and others, and there are others out there who bring similar hard-to-hear information to light, because it's not, it's not always nice to say. Just know that as hard as it is to hear these things, and I'm as human as, I'm, I'm, as, I'm a physical person as much as the next person. To hear these things all the time can, get, can, can weigh on you. We're, we're human beings. We're human beings. It can, it, can, it can weigh on us. But we're not in this, to, we're not in this alone. That's why, we're part, we're, that's why we, we connect with each other. That's why we're, we, we get connections here to help us through. As hard as it is to hear these things week after week after week, and sometimes you just want to break. But then something else happens that we need to know, but another obstacle pops up that we need to know about. There's a reason. Because coaching in a cross-country race matters. It matters that we're told these things. we got to know where the obstacles are. We have have to know how how to navigate them. There are obstacles ahead that we won't know about until we get there. Or, as we read here in Corinthians, if we're told about them in advance. If we're told about them in advance. There are training strategies that unless you're told, you'll either miss them or you'll learn afterwards, after falling, stumbling, or tripping. There are obstacles. There are training, tra- training strategies. Let's go to Matthew 28. Touch on a scripture we seem to go to every week lately, and with purpose, with meaning. This is why this section here of scripture has taken on deeper meaning to our group over the last number of weeks and months and years. Matthew 28, verse 18. Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things, all things that I have commanded you, all the way back. And we, we, won't, we won't dissect this because it's been done before. That's, that's why we, we focus on this. That's why being a disciple is such an important a part of, of, of our training and why we get coached into becoming better disciples, to be taught. And getting co- coaching is really teaching, teaching them to observe all things so that we are in line with Jesus Christ, so that we can be those who avoid the, what is coming that we read about in Revelation 12 and 13. Let's go to 1 Timothy 4. 1 Timothy 4. Timothy here, as we look back now, Timothy, this is at the end of Paul's life. He's had a long relationship with Paul as a mentor and protege. But Timothy was just a kid when he met, met Paul. He was just a young guy. His mother was Jewish. His father was Greek. He wasn't ready to be the leader that we read about him here in the, his letters from Paul. But as Paul comes to the end of his life, Paul knew he wasn't going to live forever. We see that in verse 6. We see that in, in verse 6. Hang on, folks. Give me a second. I do this all the time, eh? Let's go to 2 Timothy. Chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4, not 1 Timothy. We see that here in verse 6, that Paul knew he wasn't going to live forever. He says here, for I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. But he wasn't waiting until that to start the process. 
He had been working with Timothy because he knew he wasn't going to live forever, because he knew his time was coming to an end. He had to pass this on because somebody had to take the mantle. And we see this here as he, as he near the end of his life here, his, his concluding remarks in his last letter that's, that's for us here in the canon. I charge you, verse 1, Timothy, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. And we know his, his judgment is coming. So therefore, as we talked about here locally in our pre-sermon discussion, one of the questions we ask is, what about living a holy life while we're here? If we're trying to get to heaven, why are we, well, let's, which we're not, we're not, we're not advocating heaven, but that was part of our discussion. What about living a holy life here? That's part and parcel of readying ourselves to be judged. Preach the word, he's admonishing Timothy. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. So coach, correct, with long suffering and with teaching. For the time will come when they, many, will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you, and I'm entrusting you, Timothy, with this message, you're the next, the next coach. You're the next generation of coaches. You be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. Endurance here is mentioned because it is one of the primary necessary ingredients to running the entire race. Yet it comes about by understanding truth. That's what we read here. With all long suffering and teaching. We endure because we have truth. We endure because we know what the truth is. We know what the end goal is. We know how to get there. And we know what the obstacles are going to be in the, our way, on our way to that goal. But guess what? Other obstacles are going to arise. Teachers will arise, we're told, that will cater to the needs and the desires of the many. We hear this today. What is your truth? What is, that doesn't match up with my truth. That's itching ears. I don't like the truth, so I'm going to create my truth. I'm going to look for my truth. We will, as it says here, look for those who speak in ways that are a little easier to hear, a little easier to take in. There's only truth. There's not my truth and your truth. That's a misnomer created by, again, a world that is doing the work as minions of the adversary. It's not always easy to hear, but there is truth. But at least we know what will happen so we can be prepared. And this wasn't new to Paul. This isn't some new concept to Paul and Timothy. Let's go back to Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah chapter 30. Verse 11. As God here talks to Isaiah... And says to him in verse 8, Now go, write it before them on a tablet, and note it on a scroll, that it may be for a time to come. So it might not be for now, although it's a, it was applicable then, but if they're not going to listen, at least write it down, so future generations will be able to see this. That this is a rebellious people, lying children, children who will not hear the law of the Lord, who say to the seers, don't see, and to the prophets, do not prophesy to us right things, speak to us smooth things, prophesy deceits, get out of the way and turn aside from the path and cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from us. Write this down. There's going to come a time when people are just not going to want to hear the truth. People are going to want to say, you know what? I've, 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 I can't take this anymore. I can't take this anymore. I don't want to hear this stuff anymore. Write that down. There will come a time that this will happen. But at least we know, and we can be prepared. And we know because coaching matters. Someone told that God here tells Isaiah, he passes it, he writes it down for us to know. So that as the apostolic leaders, they read the, the, the scroll of Isaiah. We know it was quoted so many times in the apostolic writings in the Gospels. So they would have they read this, they knew this. So it was written down for a reason. So that at some point, Paul would learn it, and he could teach Timothy. 
And Timothy then could be ready to teach the next generation. Let's go to Psalm 23 as we consider this concept. Psalm 23. There's much more depth to this psalm than I can possibly convey at the end of a sermon. As I, as I start to bring this to a close, there's so much more depth to this than I can even possibly talk about in a setting like this. And obviously, it's, this has been done in the Line Upon Line studies. Please go check it out. But not just as an entity of itself. Let's, not, let's, let's open, open up our minds to the fact that this is part of a, a, a whole psaltery that... that that different psalms, especially beginning, you know, verse 19 or so, start leading up to this as, as, a, as, a, as an end point in this section. But we read here that Christ is our shepherd. That's what, we, that's what we learned from this psalm. Christ is our shepherd. And David here is conveying the mind of Christ as he went through this life and prepared for our life-saving moments of his death and his resurrection. And this is what qualifies him to be our chief shepherd. But the ministry, the leadership, operates as under-shepherds, serving at the will of the chief shepherd, tending to his flock, his way, not our way. We, tend, we are to tend his way. That's the way it should work. And We see the example of the chief shepherd here. Notice the tools and processes that are expected of Christ the shepherd and that he would expect of, of, of his shepherds, his under-shepherds. The Lord is my shepherd, the chief shepherd, of course. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in, in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. There's rest. There's guidance. There's restoration. There's, teach, there's teaching truth. There's a full projection of the future so that there's no fear. We, we, we've got the, the, whole, the whole race path lined out for us, drawn out for us, because of all that the chief shepherd allows for us here. And there's even a rod and a staff, and they're meant to comfort. A rod. How would we be comforted by a rod and a staff? A rod, a little stick about yay long. My dad, who was a, a RCMP police officer, I still have his billy club. It's about that long. And you know, if you, you know if you've been tapped with a billy club. And a staff, a little bit longer, almost like a walking stick. But the end of the walking stick is a great big hook. And that's what shepherds used. Well, how can they possibly comfort? Well, the use of these implements aren't initially comfortable. But sometimes we get ourselves into predicaments that require a hook to get us out. That we, you know, maybe get, maybe miss an obstacle, aren't paying attention. We get an obstacle and we get our, our, our leg trapped and our foot trapped in a big hole and we can't get out. So, you know, the big hook comes around our neck and God just gives us a bit of a yank and we get pulled out. Not initially comfortable. Or the paths we've taken. We could take our eyes off the goal, and maybe we need the little rod underneath our chin to just give us a bit of a tap and heads up. I can see your, your paths are taking you off in a way that you can't possibly be looking at the goal. So, you know, just, just a little, little tap to rearrange, to get us pointing to the, the right direction. This is the task sometimes of coaches who seek to emulate Paul. Verse, we recall what we read in, in Philippians 3. If you're differently minded about anything, God will reveal this to you. Only let our conduct fit the level which we have already reached. Sometimes we need a hook to pull us out or a rod to give us a bit of a tap to refocus us on that point we should never take our eyes off of. But these are used as part of our overall provision of green pastures, of still waters, and restoration in the paths of righteousness. Sometimes these tools are never used. Sometimes they're only used. Both ways are not right. But all of these tools are used together by the chief shepherd because restoration 
and green pastures and still waters are what keep us able to stay in the race. Let's go back to Philippians 3 as we conclude. Philippians 3, where we started. This is why you get what you get when you come here or tune in to our services, our studies, and our podcasts. You know, our, our, often to just hear a service, we're very blessed to be able to share this service online. But it's all part and parcel of everything else that we do here. Our pre-sermon discussion, our 12 o'clock discussion, our post-sermon, our family discussion afterwards, the times that we get together and, and meet in each other's homes, our, our, the Bible study on Wednesdays, the Keeping Watch podcast, it's all part and parcel of the, of the package here. But that's what you get when you tune in to the, or, or come here to these services, studies, or podcasts. This is why we address the important things of our time, not because we aim to be political or to support one party or the other or try to influence the outcome of an election or to support one side or the other. This is why we've, we tackle topics like social justice, like Marxism, like environmentalism, the impact of nations and leaders who are enemies of Jesus Christ, and why even next week, and again, we schedules don't permit a keeping watch. It's a, Landon's going to cover that in his announcements. But there won't be a keeping watch today due to schedules. But we will, next week, we're going to talk about the Great Reset. It's why we talk about these things. Not because we want to be political. Not because we're trying to change the world. But because there are obstacles that, are, that the adversary has put in the way and is using to make war with the saints. We do all these things because Christ tells us the adversary would make war with his saints and he, he is seeking to overcome us. These topics that we talk about, while they're not easy to listen to, while they may seem political, they're actually obstacles in your way between you and that finish line that we are not supposed to take our eyes off of. And if we didn't speak about them, we wouldn't be doing our jobs. Because you know what I know about them? Because someone else told me, because I didn't know about these until I was coached. I didn't know about these until someone pointed them out. And why did they point them out to me? Because they didn't want me to trip. They didn't want me to fall. These are all topics that are tools of the adversary and his minions in their war against the saints of Christ. And you need to know this. You need to know because it's not that we have already attained or are complete yet. We press on, aggressively pursuing the goal that has been placed before us by the faithful one, Christ the Messiah. We haven't gotten there yet, but one thing we will do together is not look back at what we've come through, but look forward to what lies ahead. Obstacles and all. Pressing together toward the mark, the goal, the prize, of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Master. Thank you for that message, Pastor Murray, and praise God for it. As mentioned, a couple of announcements. Um, the picnic our local congregational picnic will be August 13th next, uh, next week. So we'll discuss details about that. There, this upcoming week, uh, there will be no Bible study on Wednesday. Um, and uh, the Keeping Watch podcast, as mentioned, would uh, not occur this week. So rise, grab your hymnals. I forgot mine. Turn to page 64, God Speaks to Us. Page 64. <laughs>
Last hymn, we'll go to page seven, All Hail the Power, after which we'll have the closing prayer by Brother Larry Dale. Page seven. Great eternal and almighty heavenly Father, creator and sustainer of all that is, we thank you, Father, that you have once again admonished us to prepare for what is to come. We thank you, Father, that you have reminded us that there is an end to this age, an end to our lives, and that beyond that, it will be a wonderful time with us ruling under Christ. Father, we thank you that you have given us this privilege to heal the nations. We ask, Father, in the meantime, that you would be with each and every one of your children, that you would keep us from the evil one. Father, we ask that you would be with those who 
are listening in who may not be near congregation. We ask that you would support them. We ask also, Father, that you would be with those of your children who are single and alone and who have nobody to pick them up when they fall. We ask, Father, that you would be with our children, the ones who have and will bear the brunt of the societal changes that we are going through. We thank you, Father, that we can come here each week and that we can learn at the feet of a servant that you have chosen to pass on your knowledge, to admonish us, to encourage us. Father, we thank you for this guidance that you have given us. We thank you for this calling that you have given us. We ask, Father, now that you would bless the food and the fellowship to follow. We thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Remain standing. We'll go to the closing scripture. Take it from Hebrews uh, 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God.